All right, we're going to wait for a few minutes while people log on here. Good, I see people logging on. Thank you very much for joining us. All right. Okay. Oh, people are still signing in. Okay, just one more moment. Well, everyone, Welcome to our Silicon Global episode today, Ask a VC Anything. We started this series on April 3rd, and we've had a VC on every week. And VC stands for Venture Capitalist. Of course, everybody on this webinar already knows that, but just in case there are other people on here that may not know. All right, so today, we have Melissa Guzzi joining us from Arbor Ventures. Uh, Melissa has a lot of experience in Asia. I've known Melissa for, gosh, how, when did we meet Melissa? I think seven or eight years ago. Seven or eight years ago, in Hong Kong, I believe. In Hong Kong. Right, so Melissa's gonna have a lot to tell us about how they're investing globally and what her view is of Asia, and she invests a lot in fintech and data analytics, and she uh, also has had a lot of experience as a venture capitalist, which is pretty much still a male-dominated world, so maybe we'll get to hear a little bit about how Melissa has survived, not only survived, but very much achieved in this world. Silicon Dragon, if you don't know us, well, we have a lot of things on our plate, Twitter, <laughs> WeChat, videos, our Ask a VC Anything series, our mobile app, our weekly newsletter, and our books, three of them. Um, maybe I'll be doing a fourth one, stay tuned. But today at the star of our show is Melissa Guzzi, Ask a VC Anything, and I just love this picture of you, Melissa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it was pre-COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it works. It works in post-COVID as well. It does. Uh, yeah. It, 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 when I was uh, informing people online about uh, this episode coming up, I used this photo and everybody loved it. So got lots of likes. <laughs> hey, here's your crib sheet, everyone, about who is Melissa Guzzi. Well, Here's something I didn't know about her. She grew up in Connecticut. She lives in Singapore, but she's regularly traveling. She's in Silicon Valley. She's in Hong Kong. And right now, Melissa, where are you? Uh, well, I'm virtually in Singapore, as you can see from my photo. <laughs> but um, I'm sitting in the US on the East Coast at the moment. Okay. Well, Melissa set up her own firm, Arbor, Arbor Ventures, in 2013. So she's the founder and managing partner. And before that, she was managing director and group leader Asia at Vantage Point Capital Partners. And that was what a 12 year journey, right? 12 year journey. Well. Yeah. So I'm sure we'll hear about that. And she's on the board of directors at the Hong Kong Venture Capital Association and also the Singapore Venture Capital Association. Those are two really great groups. Her focus is on fintech, data, and AI. Arbor Ventures already has three funds, and she's a board member of several tech companies as well, several in the portfolio. How many is that now, Melissa? Uh, I'm on the board of six. Six, all right. Now here's something else I found out about Melissa. Now I know why she's so slim. She stays so slim. She runs a lot to meditate. That's great. Even in Singapore, huh? Even in Singapore, but you got to go early in the morning in Singapore. Otherwise, you'll melt. <laughs> That's true. So after Melissa and I do a fireside chat, we'll be coming into our questions. And those you can share with us on chat or on the Q&A. You'll see the chat and the Q&A functions on the toolbars at the bottom of your screen. And today we're gonna to be trying something new as well. 
So a little bit into our webinar, we're going to go to a new platform, which will allow us to speed network. And the speed is two minutes and you're on to the next person. And there's automatic matching through AI. It's fun. I tried it yesterday for the first time. And so we're now going to try it at Silicon Global. That's going to be fun. But we're not ready for that yet. We're going to go back here to find out more about what Melissa's up to. And I'm going to stop the share here. And Melissa and I are going to talk, talk for a little bit. OK, now I see Melissa very clearly. Uh, and I love that Singapore backdrop. Very nice, very nice. So how are you uh, surviving during this COVID-19 era? Uh, sur surviving pretty well. I actually yeah. have found a little bit of COVID-19 to be a little liberating. Uh, okay. to, time to get off the treadmill and have time to think and, uh, and, and really take that time to, you know, think about where the future is going, where we've been, where we want to focus our time and attention as a fund. So, I, you know, it's, yes, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a horrible pandemic, you know, pandemic, none of us ever thought this was going to happen on a global scale as it has, but uh, there, there's always a bright side. Right. So you're still doing pretty much what you would regularly do, except having a little bit more time to think about it in between, because you're not running around, you're not traveling as much. Well, I, I think it kind of comes from not traveling. Uh, I do exactly the same thing I do every day anyway. I get up, I run, I work, I eat, I sleep. Uh, the only difference is, I think it's the longest time in 15 years I haven't been jet lagged. And it's actually oh, yeah. the longest time I've slept in the same bed for the last 15 years. So I think it was a little bit of adjustment, you know, initially to, to not be traveling and be moving constantly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, at this point, you know, I've gotten quite used to it, and uh, I find myself with uh, a lot of very productive time. Right, so it might be hard to go back to the way you were before, right? Traveling and the jet lag and the hopping on another plane, another airport, another hotel, another meeting. I mean, are you going to ever go back to the way things were before, or is this kind of the new world for you? I think I think uh, the challenge is uh, the ability to go back to the way the world was is probably is gone for quite some time. Yeah. I think, uh, you know, one of the outcomes is I don't think global travel would be quite as fluid. And I think we're, you know, for me personally, I'm just going to have to plan a lot differently, you know, spend three months in Singapore, you know, a month in the U.S. versus the, you know, eight or nine trips a year. Um, and, and just, you know, how we're going to manage board meetings remotely. We've been doing it now because everyone is doing it. But yeah. I think as you think about the future and travel, yeah, I, I think it's going to be an adjustment. Uh, but, you know, we're, I'm, I'm agile. And, uh, and I think agility is important, especially when the world's going through times like this. Right. Well, has it impacted your investing style? No, not at all. We've been really defensive for quite some time. I mean, mm -hmm. I, as you, you know, noted, I joined Vantage Point you know, in December of 2000, right before the nuclear winter of venture capital. <laughs> and so my first 18 months in venture capital was uh, a rude awakening. I didn't, you didn't do any new investments. We spent most of our time on the portfolio. So from our perspective, the cycle has been long already. It's more than 10 years. It's been quite a long time. Right. And it was inevitable that we were going to get some sort of adjustment. No one ever imagined to the extent we have, you know, seen. But I, I think we've been, we were quite defensive. We always looked at it do we want to invest in this company even if we hit a down cycle? And if the answer was yes, you know, we made the investment. So I think from a portfolio perspective, we feel, we feel quite good. And we, we were able to get ahead of, of you know, I, at the reaction because, you know, January 23rd in Singapore, we had our first cases. And I remember coming to the U.S. and talking and saying, you know, what are you guys, you know, we need to adjust. And people would say, well, why? And you say, well, because, you know, there's, this coronavirus, and they'd say, yeah, but that's in Asia. And you say, no, let me rephrase it. The second largest economy in the world is shut down. It will have an impact. And, you know, inevitably, I think that, you know, our, our living in Asia and experiencing it and having gone through SARS as a venture capitalist as well, you know, prepared us well from a mindset perspective to really help and work with the companies to adjust. Well, that is good. I think anyone who had that Asia experience as a venture capitalist, 
did have a jump. You know, they knew what was coming in a way because I, I was in Shanghai during SARS and in Hong Kong during SARS, but I, you know, I really had no idea what this was going to be. And I flew back from Hong Kong in mid January, January 16 or 17, having no idea that a week later, you know, the world was going <laughs> to, um, but anyhow, uh, we've all been in this kind of shock period now and, um, uh, trying to get back to normal, I think. But um, you look, um, on your type of investing, are you going to be changing the type of investing you're doing? I mean, you've done a lot of fintech, you've done a lot of kind of data analytics and other areas, kind of deep tech areas uh, that are a little bit off the beaten track. Are you going to change that at all? Are you going to go into healthcare investing, for instance, because that seems to be kind of a really hot area now, or is, is that overheated? Well, I mean, uh, we do one thing well at Arbor. We do financial services, and that's what we're going to continue to do. That's, okay. That's what we, we love. I do see, you know, an intersection between healthcare and financial services. Yeah. I mean, clearly, uh, you know, when you, when you think about COVID-19 and you think about insurance, whether it's health insurance or business interruption insurance, I, I think, uh, you know, pandemics, uh, you know, the idea of a pandemic and force majeure, and how that impacts businesses and insurance is going to play a role, but we're not going to deviate from what we do. And we think there's still a tremendous amount of opportunities in financial services going forward. Well, can you talk about what you see as the opportunity in fintech, since you have quite a few portfolio companies in that area? What is, what is the, um, and how is Asia positioned in the fintech area? Uh, let, me t let me take a couple of interesting areas. So uh, number one, digitizing infrastructure. Um, mm -hmm. You know, bank branches are closed, call centers are closed. Yeah. They're going to have to start digitizing infrastructure. A good example of that is true court in our portfolio, which is uh, really digitizing debt collection. Uh, and I think, you know, we've seen, we've seen a lot of growth uh, in, in the company, especially in the last couple of months. And we expect that to consider, you know, continue. And people will say, well, is it growing because people can't pay? And you're like, no, it's growing because the financial institutions have finally woken up and realized they need to digitize their infrastructure. That's one. You know, a second example is anti-fraud. Uh, it's an area that we really like a lot. We've invested mm -hmm. in, you know, ever compliant and also in Forder. I think one of the new areas that I'm really excited about is digital regulation uh, and how it impacts financial services. I mean, at the end of the day, COVID-19 is a license for governments to implement digital regulation that they've been sort of tiptoeing around for quite some time. And I think we're gonna see a lot more around privacy and, and, uh, and data. Uh, it's no longer just a GDPR issue, it's, it's a global issue. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you ask me about Asia, I personally, I'm sitting here in the US and I'm looking around and, and you got, you know, unemployment at a record high since 19, you know, since the Great Depression. Personally, I, I think that Asia is going to come out of this uh, sooner and, and actually much stronger. And, and that's really due to the, you know, the reaction, the organized reaction to, to COVID-19. I, I think Asia's already led the world in two areas, one being payments and the second being neobanks. And I think Asia will continue to see a rapid pace of innovation uh, across the region. That's so not what, what, right. what is a neobank? What is a neobank? What were those well, two examples? Yeah. yeah, I mean, like the digital online banks like WeBank. You know, oh. I love it. You know, when you look at WeBank, 200 million registered users, 100 million active. I mean, you look at the statistics and, and the use. It's, it's phenomenal. And yet everyone's getting super excited about, you know, digital banks in the rest of the world. And collectively they have 34 million users. And yes, it's expected to grow, but it's still nowhere near what, what, what has been accomplished in China, you know, using WeBank as an example. Right. So I'm always in awe of when I have the opportunity to do a fireside chat with Henry Ma because the numbers and what they've accomplished over the last, you know, seven, eight years is, is remarkable. Right, and what was the other example you said? Neobank and, and another example you named. Payments. Uh-huh. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. We don't so have tax in Asia. We actually make digital payments. Digital payments, right. The US is still trying to figure it out, right? Still trying to figure it out. <laughs> and, and where is Europe on that? Europe's kind of in between. I think Europe's kind of in between. 
um, but I think I think around the world you've seen the pace of innovation differ. I mean, there are areas in the U.S. where uh, financial services is is quite innovative, and I especially I think you know, and and in Europe as well, given you have PSD two and and GDPR, I, I think the pace of innovation is just different, uh, and it's just not universal, and the opportunity set is not universal, and so. I don't think it's one size you know, fits all for investing in financial services around the globe. I think it's a matter of finding the opportunities in the market that you're, you're in. Okay. So in this almost post COVID-19 era, what are you telling your portfolio companies? How are you telling them to manage through this period? I think every venture capitalist is saying the same thing, right? Let's reduce CapEx, let's, you know, lim your travel's eliminated, conferences are eliminated, uh, reduce the budget, you know, cut. I mean, I, I think you have to cut the budgets. I mean, we've seen our portfolios, most of them cut the budgets anywhere from 20% to 40%. You oh, know, I, I think you, yeah, you have to assume that you're not going to be able to raise capital for 18 or 24 months. And if it turns out it's not that bad, great. But you have to plan as if uh, raising capital is, is far more difficult and you're going to have to definitely show positive unit economics uh, at the company level. So that's what we're doing. But I also, am, I also think there's something even just as important, which is, is your business relevant in a post-COVID world? Mm. And thinking about your product and your product strategy and how that's gonna fit into the, the new norm, I think is just as important. I mean, to hunker down and save money is one thing, but if your product's not relevant in post COVID world, you're, you're really no better off. And so I think challenging and working closely with the companies to think about that is, is something we're encouraging everyone to do and, and we're helping wherever we can. Yeah, that's really interesting. So maybe pivot in this time. Maybe. No one says what you did, you know, pre-COVID is you have to stick with it. I mean, I think right. you look at talented teams and they, they should ask themselves that question. Right. Like in Detroit, where the automakers were suddenly making ventilators. Sure. Or a Formula right. One team, right? They were, you know, Formula One team or Dyson, you know, instead of vacuum cleaners, they're making ventilators. Those are entrepreneurs. Right. So... Can you, uh, do you think that with the kind of way that we have to conduct meetings now, right now, is that going to be an effective way? Is that going to lead to a lot more successes in your portfolio? And how are you, how are you dealing with that challenge? Because, uh, you know, it's kind of tough to read, you know, someone's true personality online. How, how do you deal with that? Oh, so I'm a big fan of the show Lie to Me. Uh, and, and I watched every single episode and actually took the course online. I, I think, you know, we are going to be forced if you're, uh, you know, to make some decisions based upon some interactions on Zoom. And yes, it's premature at the moment. But I do think that learning to read body language, looking at technology that can analyze video is something we're considering. And, I, you know, the idea that Every, we actually have made two investments in the past where we did not meet the CEO prior to making an investment. They had great references. We knew the references. And I think we're going to be forced to think about both deal sourcing and due diligence in a very different manner going forward if this continues and persists. Yeah. So you're actually doing investments of deciding on investments through online meetings, through Zoom and follow up and all the other regular due diligence? Uh, not yet. I mean, we have, we, we've done two in the past pre-COVID. Uh, okay. Pre-COVID. So I, I think, but, you know, we're trying to learn from those experiences to see how we can apply that in a post-COVID environment where we're dependent upon using Zoom or Microsoft Teams. I had to at least pay tribute to Microsoft Teams. It's a pretty good platform. Oh, yes. Okay, sure. Of course. Yes. And Google is in there too, right? Google's in there as well. In there, and Verizon just bought Blue Jeans Network. So there's all of a sudden quite a lot of competition. People have highlighted video conferencing as a great area. Of course, Zoom, I don't think any of them have grown as fast as Zoom has. But um, yeah, so I just, um, what do you 
you think about the returns coming out of venture capital today, the investing of for 2020, what do you think this year is going to be like? Uh, for I, I think, returns? Yeah, I mean, I, I think early in the year, there was uh, some fantastic exits. Uh, you know, the, the acquisition of Plaid by Visa or Credit Karma by Intuit. And I think the second half of the year will be slow. I, I do think you'll see some acquisitions because there's a lot of cash in the, in the corporations and they probably you know, are looking to complement their, their technology portfolio. But I would suspect you know, the IPOs will be delayed to 2021. That's at least how we're thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, I think the investment pace will flow um, as, as one would expect, but it won't come to a halt. Not like, tw not like 2001, 2002. I think people just see the rapid pace of innovation and the contribution to society is too great to abandon investing in tech. Well, you think innovation is sped up in this era? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the benefits of AI and, and machine learning and what it's, how it's changing industries, and I think it's the intersection you know, of 5G cloud services and AI that's created a, a really great environment for, for innovation across so many sectors. Right. So the entrepreneurs are probably more used to this kind of online meetings and Q&A online and follow up online. But what about the limited partners? Do they, uh, do they like this or not? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, we, you know, we've been, I would say we've actually had a lot more contact with our during this period of time, um, you know, will they make decisions to invest in new funds without having, you know, met the GP in person? Hard mm -hmm. to tell, but I do think people are doing lots of Zoom calls right now. I have one later tonight, my time. And, um, you know, right now that's, that's the norm. Sure, sure. Well, um, now as a lady in the VC world, uh, can you give any tips for other lady VCs out there? Yeah, I, I think uh, you, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I can. I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's very important for women GPs to support other women GPs. Mm -hmm. you know, statistically, it hasn't been great. It's growing. It's getting better. But I, I also think a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, how people come into venture capital. Generally, it's been through a startup you know, with a technical background into a venture firm. And I, I do think it's improving. I think we need to see more entrepreneurs that are women in order to sort of have the flow of next generation, uh, you know, venture capitalists. Uh, you know, I think the most important thing, and, you know, you and I have chatted about this, Rebecca, yeah. is that Asia has actually been much better yeah. for, for women and much more welcoming than necessarily, you know, the U.S., which you still feel some passive aggressive behavior at the board level in, right. in, in some of the venture back companies where I think Asia, I mean, and maybe that's a credit, you know, a benefit of communism, right? It was gender neutral uh, and yeah. women have been able to succeed pretty well across Asia. And if you look at the venture capital, you know, you look at Jenny and you look at Nisa over at Qingming and you look at, uh, you know, Kathy at Capital Today. I mean, you got, you got a lot of very successful women in venture capital. Um, and so I think, you know, we just, we just need to continue to support the industry, grow the industry and, and really mentor, you know, the associates and analysts who are coming up. Right. Well, the women, you know, here in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of socializing that gets done on the golf course and sailing. I'm a good golfer, by the way. So that's oh, not good. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that, maybe. You know, does, do you think that that helped you as a, as a venture capitalist? No. <laughs> no? <laughs> I think it was just pure determination and grit. Oh, okay. Um, so how, how are you handling this? Are, are you under a lot of stress in this current environment? Or, and, and, you know, if, how are you handling it? You're deep breathing? Yeah. You're <laughs> I run. Uh, that's, uh, you know, I run and I, I've been actually hitting wiffle golf balls in the backyard. They don't go very far, so I can't hit anything. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think it's a balance. It's always been a balance. I think it's a balance of making sure you get enough exercise to sure. balance out the stress. Um, but it's no more stressful. I, I think this environment, except, you know, it, you know, some people have a hard time staying home and they need, right. they need to be quite sociable. For me, that's never been the case. So, you know, as long as I can run and hit wiffle golf balls in the backyard, 
uh, and, and balance that out with the, the long hours on both ends of the day. Right. Sure. I, you know, I'm pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Early morning and late at night, right? And then the middle of the day, maybe around lunchtime is not quite so bad. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of under that schedule as well. Um, so, well, let's see if we have any questions here. I do see a question here. And, oh, somebody wants to know about Detroit. <laughs> okay. Hi, Hal Kelman. He says the uh, auto industry in Detroit, 1900 Detroit was high tech going from horse and buggy to the automobile. Henry Ford's first car company had an electric engine because his friend Thomas Edison said the future was electric. It failed too early. The culture since in Michigan has seemed to be a follower, not leader. Do you think the Detroit three can transition to something else or new or no or new? <laughs> well, okay. I, I I don't, I don't know how to answer that except that I, I do believe that uh, it starts with education. I, I think, you know, if you take a look at what Singapore has done, they've changed the education curriculum to prepare young students for the next 30 years with data science and computer science. I think anywhere can be transitioned, but it starts with education and it starts at a pretty young age. And I, I do think one issue, one benefit of what we're seeing right now and maybe it's not a benefit for the US, but it's clearly a global benefit. We're gonna see a lot more diffusion and a lot more startups uh, and entrepreneurs stay at home or closer to home. Um, and I think talent will be far more distributed than maybe it's been in the past. But I, I do think it's a race to educate people at a young age for the next generation of jobs. And I was listening to the Fed chairman in the US last weekend and he said, he made a really interesting comment. What are the downsides of high unemployment is that people get stale. And that's true of white collar workers as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, he is education. We, we offered to our team at Arbor, free, take classes, we'll pay for it during this period of time. And there's a lot of great classes, whether it's at Harvard or Stanford or Imperial, I'm actually taking two myself. And, you know, use the time, use the time to, to educate and learn something. And uh, I think, you know, so I, I think it starts with education and continues with education throughout your whole life. What are the two classes you're taking? I'm taking a data science class, oh. um, but I probably need a tutor. And uh, wow. I decided to sign up for the Harvard FinTech class because I like reading case studies as a pastime. Oh, okay, very interesting. All right, we have another question here. David Smith, he wants to know, do you believe that Asia will far exceed the US in AI due to their ability to deploy the platforms more widely due to uh, reduced privacy concerns? Is it, and is it true that there are reduced privacy concerns? I mean, what do you think? Well, I, I think that uh, the race on AI is on globally and uh, Asia, China clearly has a very uh, consolidated effort and the U.S. is much more disparate, but we have some great minds in this country as well. So I, you can't predict who's going to win. I do think it won't be winner take all. I think there's certain industries where China will succeed and there's other industries where the U.S. will succeed. And maybe if you take it as an example, manufacturing, you know, maybe that's China. But when you take, you know, other, you know, areas, I, I think the U.S. will succeed. So I don't think it's winner take all one market. Okay. Stanley Kwong here in the Bay Area wants to know about with the ongoing U.S.-China trade political conflicts, what is your prediction on Asia's investments in Silicon Valley for the second half of 2020 and into next year? Well, I, I think it's going to get increasingly challenging for venture firms in Asia to invest in the U.S., but also vice versa. I think the U.S. into Asia uh, or into China particularly, you know, part of that is going to be the reduction in air travel and being able to be face to face. But the second issue is there's clearly a fair amount of tension, uh, a lot of tension in and around AI and sensitive technology that's being developed. I would suspect that, I mean, China has its own venture market today. It doesn't need the US market and the US has its own venture market and doesn't need the Chinese venture market. So I think what you'll see is continue, you know, each one of the markets will fund their companies, uh, will fund companies in their home market. Yeah. That, it there definitely does seem to be a divide coming of U.S., more U.S.-centric China, more China-centric Asia, more Asia-centric. That is definitely underway. 
Okay, so here's a question about managing time zone differences. How late and how early do you have video conferencing? And okay. do you use Eastern Standard Time or what time zone do you use to kind of anchor your global events? Oh, it's a great question. Um, it is. It, it really depends where, where I am. So um, sometimes my day starts here, uh, unfortunately, uh, every once in a while at 4 a.m., but usually 6 a.m. Uh, and uh, the flip side is, you know, tonight I'll finish at 11 p.m. So I do get, you know, a little break during the middle of the day. I think um, it's, it's about being somewhat agile. You know, people who need to work during certain hours of the day would find it extremely tiring and stressful. But, you know, I've been doing this for 15 years now. So it depends where I am. But, you know, I guess, uh, you know, Asia meetings are off Asian time. You know, usually my night, their morning. And, you know, the flip side is true. It's much easier on the East Coast than the West Coast to manage multiple time zones. Okay, well, from Silicon Valley, it's easier for Asia, but a lot more difficult for Israel and Europe. See, I think it's easier on the East Coast though, Rebecca, because you get two ends of the day. They may not be uh, as long, but you do get two ends of the day to have a touch point. So it just depends on your preference, so. That's true, that's true, okay. So what do you think about the opportunities for tech investment in Southeast Asia? This comes from James Wong, who is here in Silicon Valley right now from Vietnam. Hi, James. Yeah, I, I think Southeast Asia is, is a great market. Uh, it's not one market. It's, it's many markets. So, uh, sorry, I have to get rid of uh, my Norton on my screen. But it's many markets. So, I mean, Vietnam is very different than Singapore or Indonesia and they're very, they're very different markets, but I think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity right. in the region. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, I don't think we're any different than a lot of people seeing that opportunity because you can see the growth of, of venture capitalists there. But uh, I think, you know, over the next 10 years, we're pretty excited about uh, being headquartered in Singapore and, and, and investing in the region. So you are investing in Southeast Asia as well as globally, right? Correct. Yeah, we're headquartered out of Singapore, but we invest globally. One third of the portfolio is in Israel, one third is Asia, one third is the US. Okay, well, that's, yeah, that's really actually pretty unusual with the, is, the Israel component of it. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Why did you do Israel? You know, Israel is, uh, we, we found uh, a couple of years ago that uh, we were seeing more and more technology coming from Israel to, to Asia. And uh, we spent uh, some time in partnership there with Greenfield and looking at uh, what I would say, it's mostly deep tech around AI or anti-fraud. But we saw this great opportunity to really dominate that corridor between Israel and, and Asia. And, you know, historically, Israel has always had a very close relationship with Singapore and, uh, you know, China as well. I mean, the uh, Chinese helped out during World War II and there's, there's always been a, a fairly close relationship. So I, I think, uh, you know, uh, clearly it irritated the U.S. government enough to, to be there last week to have this discussion <laughs> about technology between Israel and China. But we do see uh, that, you know, it is a very, it's, a, it's a very relevant end market for Israeli startups to be selling into Asia, not only China, across Asia. Uh, mm -hmm. And they have an alternative to think about a different market than an end market than just the U.S. Right, right. Yeah. Now I've spent some time in Israel now. I think I have three years in a row and uh, it's just a fascinating place and a lot of tech innovation coming up in many areas there. And, and the China connection is very strong. Yeah. So here's a question from uh, Farouk Jamal and he wants to know, what are the founder mindsets that you look for in the verticals that you invest in? Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question. We're doing a lot of work around that right now, but I, I think, uh, you know, true commitment to, uh, to what you're doing as well as good judgment and reasoning are some of the key attributes along with creativity. And that's what we look for in founder CEOs early on. I mean, we, we've actually been doing a lot of work oh, during COVID on really mapping out characteristic traits of startup CEOs and looking oh, yeah. for trends and identif you know, identifying that. But, you know, I, I think, you know, for me, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty easy. You know, if somebody always says, you know, what's a turnoff in a meeting, the biggest turnoff right. in a meeting for me is when someone said, well, you know, Goldman Sachs is going to take us public and you're talking to a series A company. 
you know, I want to hear why, you know, what's behind, why are you doing this, right? What drives you? What, why is this so important to you? Because I do think the best companies, uh, the CEOs and founders have a passion beyond uh, purely money. Oh, yeah. So what are some of those characteristics that you look for when you're investing in a founder? Are there any common characteristics? Oh, I mean, grit, perseverance, intellect, uh, ability to build a team, understanding, you know, that they need to be stubborn enough not to always listen, but uh, not so stubborn that they can't listen or take input. It, it's a balance. And, and actually, I think one of the most intangible characteristics that just defines people very differently is the ability to have peripheral vision as to what's happening in the market and then act decisively on it. And I think, you know, as we've been going through this exercise, what we're seeing is that it's a very fine line uh, between success and failure. And it's not one attribute or another, but it's really a combination of these attributes. Somebody may be strong in one area, but they're not super weak in the others. And, and so mm -hmm. we're spending a lot of time working on that right now. Did you ever have a deal that was derailed because of some issue with the CEO? Of the course, every, every venture capitalist has had that issue. <laughs> can, you, can, you tell us, can you tell us one of those stories? Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, what we normally have seen, it's never one risk or one mistake that cr causes failure for a company. It's usually compounding mistakes. So, you know, it's, it's a series of really bad hires and, and can't recruit people for a variety of reasons. One, you can't build a culture or a team. Uh, or two, you know, uh, an inability to really read the market and, and understand what the customer wants and, 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 and you just get product market fit constantly wrong. I think, or you, you get somebody who's a complete visionary, but they can't execute, you know, at all. I, I think the, the, the characteristics and, and the mistakes are common across so many companies. But just because somebody doesn't make a mistake, a glaring mistake, that doesn't mean they're going to be successful because it is a fine line between success and failure. And timing. There's luck that comes into venture capital. That's what I found. Ooh, yeah. So have you ever replaced a, a founder at one of your portfolio companies? You know, in Advantage Point, we did uh, quite often. We didn't really see much correlation in success or, or, or failure. I think, I think what's been... What, what's worked really well at Arbor for us is not replacing the CEO, but really asking the CEO, you know, to, to find that teammate that really can complement them. Uh -huh. And, you know, I think it's a really easy question. Do you want your stock to be worth more or less? And if it's more, then go out and find the people who can really complement you and really help you build a company. And, and so we, uh, I don't think we actually have replaced a CEO uh, in our portfolio at Arbor, um, actually maybe one. Um, but I, I think it's, it, that's, that's a much better approach in my mind. I, I think when we invest and maybe because this is Asia, we never go into an investment and say, we can replace the CEO. I think in Asia, you have to assume you're not replacing the CEO. Mm. I think that's probably true in Israel as well. And so, uh, we spend a lot of time getting to know the CEO before, before we invest. What advice do you have for entrepreneurs who may be looking to Asia to expand or into a new market? It, expansion is tough from the U.S. to Asia, uh, but I, it's, it's obviously very possible. And as you build a global company, it's, it's, it's necessary. I think, you know, my, my advice is hire locally. You know, hire people who have been on the ground, who understand the market, and yeah. you're going to need to adapt your product for, for a very different market. And, and it may be, you know, it may be a subset of the product. It may be a different approach to, you know, a problem. But if you just are very rigid and say, this is the product that works in the U.S., it's going to work in Asia, I think, I think you're, going to, you're going to be really challenged. So I would, I would suggest be open-minded, get market feedback, understand the product before you go out and hire a huge team and spend the money doing so because it'll pay off in the long run. What about the flip side? What if you're in Asia and you get hired in the Bay Area, in San Francisco Bay Area to come here? Any advice for them? Well, same thing, localize. 
localize. I mean, localize. It's the same yeah. thing. It's it's really it's really no different. I mean, it, we we've seen this before with Asian companies, uh, where they come to the U.S. and they don't localize. Um, and localize localization means a lot. It means how you treat employees. What are the benefits? You know, even travel policy. I mean, a lot of the Chinese companies have very you know low hotel allocation. You know, per diems. That doesn't work if you're going to Washington D.C. or San Francisco, unless you're, you know, going to end up in a, in perhaps in a neighborhood that, you know, may be challenging, right? So, right. I, I think you've got to localize both both ways. Right, right. So, what's been your best deal, Melissa? What, out of all the deals you have in your portfolio, what was your best deal, and why was it your best deal? Oh, there's no such thing as a best deal. We have many companies <laughs> that we really like. We have a great portfolio. We have a great group of entrepreneurs and. And, and, you know, of course there are those that are, are some of them are growing and succeeding really well, but uh, there's no, there's no favorites. It's just like, but that's the answer every parent gives. Oh, I can't give a favorite among my kids, right? So you exactly. But, you know, I, I think, you know, I think part of the reason I, I say that is, you know, in venture, you don't always know the winners and the losers as you're in the process. Yeah. But we have a lot of really promising companies. I mean, Payday in Japan has done a great job and Akulaku. And you know, True Accord and Porter and Funbox and Ever Compliant. I mean, we've got a we've got, you know, and TrueMid uh, who ha who is expanding to Asia. We we've got a great portfolio and a, and a great group of CEOs. And those are in fintech and data yes. areas. All yeah. of them. Yep. We 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 all of them. Yep. We stick with we do one thing. We do that well. We stick with it. Okay. And and I think it's very important. Uh, I'll give you a great example. Buy now, pay later. We started in that market in Japan. We expanded to Indonesia with Akulaku. And then we recently closed on a great investment in Dubai. Same mark, same thing, buy now, pay later with a great entrepreneur, Hosam. So I think, you know, we, when you understand a market, uh, we've leveraged that knowledge and, and done multiple investments sometimes in the sector. And that goes across regions, Israel, Asia, US? Yeah, so I mean, well, in the buy now, pay later, it's been Japan, Indonesia, and in uh, in the UAE. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is, you know, the, the companies aren't exactly the same, but the knowledge base and and the sh the the learning for both the the CEOs and for us has been tremendous. Okay, well, good. We're going to now segue into our speed networking, and. Give me a minute to get this share screen here so that we can go to go to the link for the I hope all of you can see the slide here and the link that you'll need to go to for the speed networking. I almost said speed dating, but it's speed networking. <laughs> and the link is joined glimpse dot io slash silicon global so i have to cut and paste this as well and go into yes. it okay. yes both of us will both of us will go into this and so in we actually have the founder of glimpse who's on this webinar right now so uh they can answer any questions that might come up while we're uh, getting on here but everybody is going to go on here now and uh we're going to try it out should be fun. And I also should mention that we're gonna come back here at about a little before five uh, to close things up and to also go into our traditional toast, uh, wine toast and uh, our discussion group. So uh, please when you, I'll give you the cue about coming back in, but please enjoy this speed networking session. And thank you Glimpse for being here and helping us with this.
Okay, I'm in the room. Okay, I'm in the room. Let's see. I'm not putting in my birthday. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah, I, I made that up myself. <laughs> okay, fine. I'll make one up. So, so far, it's just uh, Melissa and me. Uh, let's see, there's 20 attendees here. Okay. Lower all hands, participants. Start. Okay. Okay. Agree. Get ready. You'll have 10 minutes, 10, minutes, 10 seconds to accept. Okay. Here's uh, hey, Anthony. Uh, Anthony. Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you. How are you? Super cool. Good. I really loved your talk. Um, probably my favorite part was uh, when you were talking about how you read case studies for fun. Yeah. <laughs> I was just cracking up. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of missed the beginning. I'd love to hear a little bit about your background. Like, why did you go into VC? You mentioned at the beginning that, like, technical founders tend to go into that. Is that your path as well? Uh, I did start up in the semiconductor area, and then I actually joined a venture capital firm that, that funded me. So I did a startup first and then made the transition. Super cool. And the one that you're at now, though, is the is one you started yourself, right? Correct. Okay, super neat. Uh, what's that process been like? Uh, it's like doing a startup. <laughs> it's exactly like doing a startup. Uh, you know, there's nobody there to clean your coffee cup still at Arbor. Uh, you know, you got to do things yourself. I do PowerPoint myself. Um, no, I, I mean, I think I always enjoyed doing the startup in the early phases. And uh, we've tried to keep Arbor exactly the same way, which is, you know, don't lose touch with your entrepreneurial roots. Because when you're, when you're funding entrepreneurs, you have to have empathy for what they're doing. And I think uh, sometimes you can get too far away from the core. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, do you think stress-wise, is it the same being a founder versus like the founder of your own VC fund? Oh, absolutely. It's the same. But you got to like stress. I mean, I thrive on stress. So, yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know if, if your idea of fun is just going to the beach, it's kind of hard to be a VC or to do a startup. I, no, I think you're not the right fit. <laughs> right? You're, you know, you're, it's not the right fit. So I kind of thrive on it. The busier the day, the happier I am. Okay, we're out of time. Great meeting you. Nice meeting you. Hello. Hey, hello, Melissa. How are you? Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Singapore. Ah. <laughs> I lost my Singapore yeah. background. <laughs> yeah, very good, very good, very nice. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, your comments were very uh, impactful. Uh, thanks for quoting Singapore as an example in the government proactiveness in uh, reskilling Singapore people in education. Uh, this has not been easy. Yeah, uh, for, for me, I'm actually running a uh, family office, focusing on supply chain. Uh, we are still quite an old, uh, old school supply chain uh, team. Uh, very much paper based. Uh, um, but uh, I think this COVID has uh, basically accelerated our team's uh, uh, recorded focus to looking at partners. So when you mention you look at FinTech, uh, I'm uh, also quite uh, keen maybe next time we can pick some ideas from you and explore partnerships. We were very new to, to FinTech. We've been approached with many proposals from Bitcoin to crypto to uh, uh, what they call it blockchain and, and things like that. Uh, so uh, in, in Singapore, uh, if really I, I will consult uh, my friend uh, from Jubilee Capital. I don't know them from Jubilee Capital. Uh, they they uh, a VC also focusing on fintech, but primarily in the in the Bitcoin uh, blockchain space. So uh, they're the one that usually I consult with once in a while. But I think I probably need more uh, input at the same time uh, 
Provincial Partnership with the. Uh, well, oh, we lost him. So uh, maybe uh, Rebecca, you can just give him my email. I'm happy to help. I can't hear you. Okay. The speed networking is very fast. Very they fast. have, yeah, it's two two minutes, less than two minutes per session. Hello. I'm Carrie. Nice, nice to meet you, Carrie. We met before. I'm with Invest Hong Kong with Lauren. Yes. How are yes, you? Nice to see you. Good to see you as well. Good. So you're in the States now. Uh, I got caught in the States uh, when the, the quarantine went in place in Singapore. So I'll be here till I go back. Unless uh, uh, they don't open it up soon enough. I'm a PR in Hong Kong. Then I'll go back to Hong Kong. <laughs> going back to Hong Kong. Uh, well, we're working at home also. And uh, it's not ideal. I was just on a big VC and they all love it. But I think they have their own office and everything set up. But, but for us, we're a kitchen table. It's not that efficient. <laughs> I understand. I'm sitting at a dining room table right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Well, we uh, support your. We like your support for Hong Kong. And um, uh, do you think um, Singapore is going to open up quicker before Hong Kong does? Or? No, I, I think Hong Kong is going to open. Up. I'm also a PR in Hong Kong, so I can come back here. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I, I think Hong okay. Kong has done a really great job of managing through COVID, and uh, you know, I, I think the you know. For, for, they've really been able to manage it, and that's probably their experience with SARS. So I, I think Hong Kong, you know, will probably open. Up, it seems like it's opening up more, you know, faster than Singapore. Singapore still has quite a few cases every day, and um, you know, at some point, uh, if Singapore doesn't open up relatively soon, I'll come back to Hong Kong, and my dog and my helper can come. <laughs> Oh, yo, who, somebody, somebody has to take care of your dog then. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, he's, Poor dog thought he was abandoned. I called the other night, and he just started crying when he heard my voice. It was killing me. Oh. <laughs> what kind of dog do you have? I have a Coton de Tuliar. So he's oh, a white little oh, fluffy thing. Long, is, it, is that Hungarian? Uh, no, they're from Madagascar. Oh, Madagascar. Oh, okay. Does he have a big dog? Well, bye. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing you. Bye-bye. Okay. Good to see you. Hello. So uh, I don't know if you've met my colleague Terry Bonner, but I work with Lauren uh, as part of the Invest Hong Kong team. Michael. Yes, I know Lauren's pretty well. Yeah, so I was listening to your every word. It was like very fascinating. Well, thank you. I'm no, glad you enjoyed it. Good. How are things in Hong Kong? Well, actually, I'm located in San Francisco. Oh, you are. Um, it's starting to open up in Hong Kong. You know, where you can go out to eat, but it has to be only eight people to the table and space apart. And uh, of course, foreigners are not, still not allowed into Hong Kong. No, but I'm a PR, so I actually could go back in, right? Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's a good thing I have my PR. <laughs> But I, I think the flights are pretty difficult. My my plan is to stay here for a couple more months, uh -huh. probably till September. Well, I'll uh, like start me up Hong Kong, gone virtual. Uh, Global Match 2020, that's gone virtual. Yep. So. I I think it's uh it's the new norm for the rest of 2020. We're going to do the HKBCA event virtually as well, um, okay. in July. And it'll be the first time we try it. So we're of course oh, we're wow. going to try it with the venture, the venture forum first. What what's the date for that, Melissa? Uh, I gotta look it up actually. It's um, hold on, let me look it up. But um, it's it is Monday. It's July sixth. Oh, July sixth. Oh, okay. 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 Yeah. So, you know, we're gonna try it virtually and we'll see how it goes. So, okay, bye. bye. It comes from you, Rebecca. <laughs> I thought we were already connected. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think what we're gonna do now is we're going to go back to the Zoom meeting to close out the glimpse session. I hope everyone enjoyed the glimpse uh, speed networking 
And thank you, Glimpse, for giving us a chance to try it out. I really appreciate it. And now I am going to go back to our normal course of action here. Uh, stop share. Uh, I think, uh, can you hear me? Oh yeah, yes. here we go. Is that Helene or not? All right, so going back. Trying to get back to the webinar. Well, there. I'll tell you what. Um, You're back. Are we back? Yep, we're back. We're back. Okay. That's good. So, everyone, uh, we are going to be going into the Hollywood Squares part of this, uh, where we get to see everyone's faces, which is a lot of fun, I think. And uh, then we're going to, you should be receiving an email about that in any moment. Uh, with the login details. And uh, then I would also like to invite everyone to come to our next session, which will be, which will be next week. And at Thursday at 5.30 p.m. with Sean O'Sullivan. Sean O'Sullivan, who was the guy who gave us maps on Google, and he's a technologist and an, a venture accelerator with activities in Taiwan and Shenzhen and San Francisco and Ireland. Interesting guy. And so I uh, hope that everyone will tune into that at 5.30 next week. And let's thank Melissa for joining us today and giving her all of her words of wisdom, we really appreciate it, Melissa. Thank you so much for being here. So now let us, in this meeting, uh, with our toast, <laughs> do our little toast here, before we segue into the Hollywood Squares meeting. Okay, so just for directions, in case no one else wants to ask, I'll ask. So we close this out, we get the email, we click on that. That's right. Yeah. From Eventbrite, right. you're going to get a link uh, that will show you directly how to go into Hollywood Squares Silicon Global. So I will see you over there in a moment. Yeah. Rebecca, I'll thanks for everything. It's been fun. Yeah, I'll yeah. It's, thank you very much. Thank thanks. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.